my name is uh, Jason J. Rock Houston, and you're listening to uh, episode two of Gar Boris's Time Machine. And uh, for this episode, we're going to be talking about um, the Doors and the fact that um, 2021 marks the 50th anniversary of, the door, of both the Doors' um, L.A. Woman album and um, also the death of uh, Jim Morrison. So we got quite a bit to talk about. And I guess, Gar, the best place to start this off is if you could share with us um, how you first became a Doors fan. Oh, I was a kid back in the uh, uh, back in the late '60s when they came out with "Light My Fire." Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was being played on the radio all over the place, and it was so funny because I was real young, and and I was with uh, one of my neighbor's kids, and uh, we were playing with our Matchbox cars. Wow, well, that's taking me back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I used to have it. And they were new back in those days. Yeah, it was yeah. like the real popular, uh, you know, car toy uh, for kids to oh, yeah, play yeah. with. Yeah. And uh, the neighbor's kid had a Firebird, and he kept saying, come on, baby, light my Firebird. Wow, wow, wow. wow. <laughs> because back in those days, light my fire... Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, light up your tires. Okay, yeah. Wow. You know, when you got your tires spinning on your car, you're lighting it up. Wow, wow. And so, you know, that's kind of what he was referring to. He's lighting up his firebird. Oh, okay. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> and, and you know, it's kind of that's kind of very interesting because um, I'm a little bit younger than you. Um, just so people have a reference here, um, I was born um, 1971. So. Um, specifically talking about L.A. Woman and when The Doors first came out, like, um, well, when The Doors first came out, I wasn't even alive, just to give you some perspective. But that's um, that's going back, you know, f- almost 50 years. I'm about ready to turn 50 years myself this year. So The Doors, you know, The Doors are a little bit older than I am, but um, still this music um, has a special place in my heart. And very much like you, Gar, kind of um, my first exposure to The Doors ever was um, that's one of the first songs I ever heard on the radio by The Doors was Light My Fire. And um, it's kind of interesting because that song um, has all kind of uh, different innuendos. I mean, I was reading on uh, the Wikipedia today in reference to The Doors. Uh, um, they actually appeared on um, the Ed Sullivan show of all, of all places because that was a show where a lot of these uh, big music bands used to go back in the day. And, and they were told... Um, they wanted them to, uh, if they were going to play Light My Fire to change the lyrics. I forget what they wanted them to change it to, but Morrison and the band purposely, you know, they, they made this agreement, okay, we'll go on the show and we'll, 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 we'll do what you're asking. But being the rock rebels that they were, they, they played it um, in the original form and, and Ed Sullivan was so pissed off when they came off the stage, he would not um, shake hands with any of the band members. I was watching the Ed Sullivan show. I think the first time I watched the Ed Sullivan show was, uh, you know, earlier in the 60s when yeah. the Beatles came yeah. across the pond. Wow, wow. And uh, made their first uh, performances in the United States. And it was a big, big hoopla. And uh, they performed on the Ed Sullivan show. And I, I remember, you know, it was such a big deal back him performing yeah. on his, uh, his show uh, that everybody was at home watching that yeah. and uh, crime went down <laughs> it was just like everybody was glued to their TV so I had been watching the Ed Sullivan show for quite a while and I, I saw Stevie Wonder perform wow. on the Ed Sullivan show it, it was basically uh, people that what we consider today iconic and you know long kind of past historic uh performers uh performed on his show uh stevie wonder performed wow. on as a kid and he just uh when he performed on that show he it was just him as a kid and a harmonica wow and he just wowed everybody with yeah. that performance and that was you know him as a kid yeah and, and you know when, when you stop and think too uh, um even back then you realize you know, not only is this guy talented musically, I'm talking about Stevie Wonder, but, um, you know, when you realize, oh, the guy's doing that, you know, with the harmonica, man, and he's playing like that, and he's he's blind. Well, you know, just uh, forget about the talent for him, just to what it must have taken for him to learn how to do that, you know? 
the skill. Yes, yes. So the Ed Sullivan's show was a launching pad for a lot of uh, acts that, to, by today's standards, we consider them historic. They're there are people that are in the uh, Hall of Fame oh, yeah. and, and, you know, things like that. It's just, it wasn't just some TV show. It was, uh, and, and he always started his show saying, we have a really, really big shoe. Yeah. And, Instead of yeah. show, he w- it sounded like he was saying shoe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and um, <laughs> speaking of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, just while we're on the subject of the doors, I was reading, they they uh, were inducted in 1993, um, and so that's just kind of an interesting note. And getting back to Ed Sullivan, um, which I didn't know we were going to really talk about, but it, it's kind of interesting because um, Ed Sullivan's show, like you said, when people hear that name, I mean, a lot of it um, is a reference point for the Beatles, and, and like you're kind of saying, Ed Sullivan and that show in particular, um, it was a launching pad for a lot of these artists who were then kind of just on the rise, just kind of make, starting to yes. make some noise. They And it, it shows you that this guy, Ed Sullivan, um, he had such an eye for talent because several of those bands that would play on that show would go on to become legendary artists in their own right. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it just the list goes so long. I think uh, it launched Elvis Presley. Mm-hmm. And I think the controversy about Elvis Presley was was that they could only keep the camera from the waist up uh, because early in his career, he did a lot of dancing uh, and they considered uh, what he was doing with his dance moves from the waist down as vulgar. And, uh, you know, so they would only show him uh, from the waist up. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's just a, a different time where you know everything was complete, very very uh, uh, organic, conservative, yeah. and and very very you know. I mean, uh, they they you know they kept uh, basically uh, young crowds are rebellious yeah they they and, weren't they, and uh the, you know it was trying to keep the rebellion down yeah i mean they're much so um much more woke today um a lot of these um I mean, they're, they're trying to really shut we got the thought police so much that um i mean i was laughing on the last few days i mean the big stories of a week were um the, the disney who now owns the muppets okay they are um they're continuing to play the Muppets and old um, episodes of a Muppet show like on their Disney streaming service, but they're putting a warning up that um, Kermit the Frog and Friends are racist because, and they've, they've gone to the, um, Dis- this is Disney, you know, rating their, um, kind of putting a censor on their own um, property here, um, that Kermit the Frog and Friends are kind of racist because um, in some of the episodes, for example, one episode, um, there's a there's on display a... a um, confederate flag and 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 you know it just i bring this up because you know back in the day when i'm watching you know the muppet show i'm not really looking to see if um you know these puppets are racist or anything it's not what i'm looking for you know um again um just another uh thought i wanted to kind of put out there you know <laughs> well you know t- times were different yeah yeah <laughs> and and what was acceptable then. back then yeah. Um, has become uh, un- unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. And you know, so uh, there, you know, there's there's a lot of things. You watch old cartoons, yeah, and yeah. you see things that are uh, unacceptable, and you just you, you, it's just uh, as time goes along, society changes. Yeah, yeah. And what is acceptable at that time later on uh, can easily become unacceptable. I guarantee you. Uh, that uh, things that are acceptable today, today, yeah. right now, yeah. uh, in about 20 to 30 years, will also be uh, uh, unacceptable. Yeah, even... even things uh, that we yeah. don't even, you know, think about, or... Uh, that's just the way things uh, go. E- evolve. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, yeah. it's society, societal change shift. Yeah. And it's not... A person, or it's not a anything. It, it's just what society as a whole 
decides. Yeah, you know, well, part of it to me is like um, even if you go back to like some of our favorite music from the eighties uh, that they were trying to censor. You know, like just you know bands like Twisted Sister and that. I mean, um, wanting to put a sticker on a label. I mean, it's kind of gone the other way. Not just wanting to censor stuff, but um, wanting to cancel people. And and a lot of it has to do with um, what I will call the woke mentality in the sense that, um, like I said, for example, Disney. Um, you know, I kind of get the feeling the reason they're um, going to the length of you know putting war a warning label on the Muppets and that is they're kind of um, putting. Uh, it's what I call virtue signaling. Like you know, okay, we're 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 a good company, even though we um, own this, um, you know, the Muppets now. Um, we want to put a warning out there that, that we're aware of this, you know. It's, it's Disney's lawyers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, that's that's basically what it is. It, it was Disney's lawyers say, you know what, we think it's a good idea that you do this, that, you know, it protects us for you know from litigation and okay. uh, possible future law. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's not Disney. It's Disney's lawyers. Okay. Deciding. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, just, uh, you know, kind of what we're talking about, about societal changes and stuff like that, uh, we're, we're talking about a decade that the doors came out uh, when huge societal shifts were happening, yeah. and uh, part of those societal shifts and and the pushback uh, from the younger uh, was people like Jim Morrison, and that's what got him in trouble because you know when you when you really look at it, uh, it's the uh, you know heavily conservative. Uh, you know, uh, try to keep you know try to keep the young people down. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, rebellion. You know, basically, uh, you know, putting these pressures on uh, Jim Morrison uh, at his shows, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, it's it's just him uh, being one of those uh, people that became famous for pushing back. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, so much so that, um, you know, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, this album that's 50 years old, L.A. LA Woman. Now, um, just going down the track listing, okay, um, there's a song called The, the Changeline, um, Love Her Madly, Been Down So Long, um, Cars Hiss By My Window, uh, L.A. Woman, La America, uh, Hyacinth House, um, Crawling King, Snake, um, The Wasp, Texas Radio, Writers... Writers and the Storm. Now, um, th three of these tracks here on this album are really big hits. There's obviously the title track, L.A. Woman, Writers of the Storm, I'm sure we've all heard of, and um, The Wasp, you know, Texas Radio, um, and Love Her Madly. Um, now, if you if you were to hear just like um, a lot of people, you hear the title track, L.A. Woman, great rock and tune, and you pr probably a lot of people will initially think um, just by listening to that and maybe Writers of the Storm, you think, okay, I mean, these are two, you know, even Lover and these two, two great kind of three great classic rock songs, you know, and you think pretty rock and tunes, and they are. But if you listen to the rest of the album, it is really like heavily blues influenced. Well, the, a lot, you know, most beginnings of rock and roll was blues influenced. Yeah. Uh, when you, you know, uh, another band or, or, or you know, uh, artist that became hugely popular right around the same time that the doors became popular was uh jimi hendrix oh yeah and back in the uh you know late 60s when uh his music exploded um everybody considered that like the the hardest rock or the you know what what they would consider heavy metal at that time that time yeah yeah and and nobody was really listening to it as blues hmm. uh but you fast forward to now and you listen to it it's he it's 90 percent heavily blues influence oh yeah with just you know uh the element of the rock, you know, you know how Jimi Hendrix ch changed uh, playing guitar. Oh yeah, uh, because he was uh, introducing the electric guitar to blues music, and um, and doing things on the guitar that you know, as far as electrically, had yeah. never been done before. Uh, he was, you know, there's there's two guitarists. 
uh, that go down in history uh, that that just make them stand out above all of the rest. And I'm not saying that they're better. Yeah, yeah. But it makes th- th- what they did that made them stand out. above yeah. everyone else was they changed how guitar was played. Well, obviously Hendrix, and then I'm, I'm going to guess it was the- Hendrix, and the other one was Eddie Van Halen. Wow, wow. Okay. Yeah. So you know, um, you know, both of those guys completely changed how guitar was being played. Yeah. Uh, with Jimi Hendrix, it was the electric element, the utilization of feedback musically, um, the utilization of effects pedals. Yeah. Uh, musically, uh, to get sounds out of these pedals that to this day people still have to work their asses off to try to emulate. But, you know, this is when these pedals were brand new, and then you take a guitarist like Jimi Hendrix and he pushed these pedals to their extremes. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, so, you know, he he literally, there was guitar playing before Jimi Hendrix. And after. And then once he hit the same scene, everything changed. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah. literally everything changed. Yeah. And, you know, the element of distortion became hugely prou- pronounced, and there was just so many things that he was doing on guitar that were just not being done before he hit the scene because i was listening to music at that time yeah. and it's it's a pivotal moment but the exact same thing happened when eddie van halen uh you know broke the scene too yeah yeah and, and, you know, uh, because uh, yeah. i was i was a kid in high school and i remember uh hearing about van halen this is years before they uh broke you know up. came yeah. out with their first album and they had a huge talk around town and i i remember uh you know when it got closer to them uh you know launching their album and i was playing in a band and i was at rehearsal and one of the guys in my band was saying yeah i, I saw Van Halen, you know, what I mean, because they were the big talk of the town. Yeah, and uh, and and what he was talking about at that rehearsal was how Eddie would turn around so people couldn't see what he was doing on the guitar. Yeah, I'll tell you, because he was yeah. doing the finger hammer. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, but now before that nobody was doing it yeah. or you know and and the way it was being done by eddie was not being done and then all of a sudden eddie freaking just took that to its extreme yeah. he you know i mean he didn't just do hammers he just revolutionized that technique of playing guitar then boom right after eddie Everybody started doing the hammers. Yeah, and you know, um, going back to Hendrix for a minute, um, the thing about Jimi Hendrix, I mean, he was kind of, um, he was one of those amazing players. Not just his playing, I mean, he was a great singer, a great front man, uh, and then even getting to the guitar playing, I mean, um, I remember seeing videos where the guy would play the guitar with his teeth, of all things. and um, Nobody was doing that before Hendrix. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I seen videos where he's setting stuff on fire. Um, and, you know, probably um, the only thing that really predates uh, Jimi Hendrix that comes close to hard rock or metal would be Tony Iommi, you know, obviously um, the fretmaster. But, um, and getting back to Eddie, what you were saying, um, it was actually David Lee Roth, of all people, the lead singer from Van Halen. He was the one telling Eddie early on in the, in the band's, like, club days, hey, Ed, don't let anybody see what you're doing. Um, have your back turned to people so they can't see what you're doing. Um <laughs> That's that's kind of what, what I've heard over the years. So that's kind of interesting that David Lee Roth, the singer in the band of all people, had that mindset to know that um, what Ed, Eddie was doing early on was that impressive. Hey, don't let anybody steal your tricks, you know? Yeah, he just set the standard. And then, and, you know, and then by the time he had just pushed it to its extremes it you know it became extremely difficult for anybody to even be able to uh equal what eddie was doing yeah um so you know but you know both both guitarists that's what separates them from other guitars because uh, and and you know there's going to be a lot of people that are going to have different opinions yeah yeah 
than myself and and all I can do is is just you know voice you know because I was there yeah I witnessed it I saw it in its chronological order yeah and everything but um you know there, a, say take for example there are uh, you know a gazillion people that to this day uh, totally worship everything that Eric Clapton yeah. did on guitar and he is considered a great guitarist and um you know and you can't take anything away and what i'm not talking about is personal preference yeah yeah i'm talking about because once you re you know once you reach the level of uh becoming a great guitarist it, it's it's kind of like you're you're past that line and you're in greatness yeah yeah uh, it it just be, it becomes a matter of uh, personal preference and personal opinion how you feel about them because one you can't sit there and say one guitarist is greater than another or this or that it's personal opinion. preference yeah. and, and and personal opinion after that and they're all great they are you know you you just go down the list of all these legends yeah. Jeff back eric clapton you know i mean and the list goes on and on tony iami you know what i mean yeah yeah but there's two guitarists that stand out that what separates them from the rest of the pack it is they changed how guitar was being played oh yeah and that's Jimi hendrix and that's eddie van halen and, and uh, nobody can ever take that away from both of those guys and you know it, yeah. you know I, I you know it, i cannot stress how big of a word of mouth was going on in los angeles about van halen before they ever got signed yeah. they were playing backyard parties that had thousands of people that were showing up wow. and this was on a regular basis yeah yeah and, and you know it, it's it's pretty amazing because i mean all those guys you mentioned very talented guitar players in their own right now I, I will say this you know jeff beck um eric clapton eddie van halen even had a much longer career than hendrix which is really amazing and, and that little bit of i mean um, very much like Jim Morrison, who we're talking about today, Jimi Hendrix mm -hmm. died relatively young, and look at the body of work that guy left behind. Well, Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison are part of the 27 Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and and that's you know that uh, you know and and you know just to put things in perspective, uh, look at what they. Uh, achieved in short amounts of time yeah. because when uh, when they released uh, Light My Fire, that was like 67? Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And then uh, Jim Morrison died in, what, 71? Yeah, yeah. Yes, nice. That's really not a really long period of time, uh, you know, to, you know, you know, be performing and, and, and having, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, you know what I mean? They, they yeah, achieved, yeah. achieved so much in a short amount of time. Yeah, and you know, you know yeah, interesting about the Doors is Jim Morrison. I mean, um, uh, if we're if we're honest here, as talented as the rest of the band is, Jim Morrison became this iconic figure. I mean, he he kind of uh, became front man, the center of attention. I mean, when you think of the Doors, that's who everybody immediately thinks of, and um, nothing against the other guys, but it, it, you know, it's the truth. And part of it is, I mean, when we think of Jim Morrison, all these years, fifty years after he's you know passed on. I mean, um, initially, I mean, he went to UCLA Film School. He was into making films. He was a poet. People think of him as a poet, a writer, not just a great frontman and a sing, you know, singer for the Doors. But um, in fact, he has this book coming out June 8th of this year of all these um, like unpublished uh, poems and writings that somebody found. And um, it's kind of a diff just a different side of what Jim Morrison was all about and into. Um, for all his fans out there, you know, a little something to give the fans all these years later. Well, he had a magnetism. Yeah. And that's what, you know, what made him a star. And it wasn't one thing. Mm -hmm. It was a, a whole bunch of uh, things. It was a combination of things. Yeah. 
you know, he had, uh, you know, all the girls, you yeah, know, yeah. thought he was just, you know, such a, you know, had that tall, dark, and handsome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, thing going on, you know, with, uh, you mix that with the, the, the bad boy. You know what I mean? And he's he's a, got long yeah, hair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's part of that rebellious, uh, you know, hippie group. Yeah. You know, that, you know, during that time period, which was also, you know, an attraction uh, during that time for the female uh, yeah. part, part of the audience. Um, there was the artistic side of him. Oh, yeah. Uh, the fact that um, he was, uh, you know... Uh, always doing plays on words it, 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 he yeah. became really really good at improvising poetry uh which uh you know it, it is a crucial element to Song what writing. rap artists yeah, yeah, do yeah you know what I mean? Yeah. When when they're talking about getting up and, and freelancing w with rapping and stuff like that, very similar. You're free, uh, free-forming and improvising with your lyrics as you're yeah. doing it to beats. So, you know, he, he had that element. He had the uh, introspective of uh, combining all of these influence, influences uh, from... Uh, other uh, poets and yeah, philosophers yeah. and writers and you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So he was combining all of that uh, to be able to Put uh, it into his music. utilize yeah. that for his ability to write and 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 come up with uh, lyrics that were very poetic. Yeah, let's let's talk about some of those poetic lyrics. I mean, especially um, the song that kind of uh, introduced both of us to the Doors, and that's "Light My Fire." I mean. That song right there has got so many innuendos. We were talking earlier about um, um, playing that on the Ed Sullivan show and them being asked to kind of change, alter the lyrics, and they said they would, and then being the rock rebels that they were, they kind of um, you know broke the promise, and they did it anyways. And, the crucial element. But, but, but let's listen to the lyric. Now, light my fire. I remember the first time I heard it, just innocent, innocent you know, young um, lad, um, having no idea what it meant, but as I got older... Light My Fire, it has a sexual innuendo. And then I guess the reason I was reading Ed Sullivan wanted them to alter their lyrics, he thought Light My Fire also had a drug reference. And he's like, no, we don't want... So it kind of is in the eye of the beholder and what the listener gets out of it, you know. But um, just something as simple as Light My Fire, I mean, it struck a nerve with so many people, so many different innuendos. It's just very interesting. One, one song could have so much effect on so many people in a different way. Well, it's like a painting. Yeah, yeah. Part of the reason why a artist will paint a picture is is it's up to the person that's looking at the yeah. picture to try to figure out what's the thinking is behind yeah, that yeah. picture. You yeah. see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And everybody looks at that picture, and when you talk to them afterwards and you ask them what they think about it, and every single person will tell you a different outlook on that picture. Yeah, yeah. And that's the same thing with uh, uh, songs. When you write a song, yeah. uh, the reason why a person writes a song uh, when you're be being creative, like like a guy like Jim Morrison, is you're looking at it like a picture. Yeah, you're yeah. listening to it instead of looking at it. And then you come up with your own what you know what you think and then there's going to be people you know but you you can t just go walk down the street yeah have them listen to that song and then ask them what they think about or, or you know that what that guy's talking about and you every single person will have something completely different than the last person and the latin yeah. and so on and so on and so on that's you know that's part of you know, why he is so highly regarded is because, you know, that's that's art. That's yeah. why they call them artists. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, Gar, I got to ask you, um, obviously The Doors was kind of an influence, or at least, you know, in your record collection. I was kind of curious, being that I know you start out um, musically as a bass player, um, it's 
kind of interesting because the Doors, I mean, they got four guys in the band, but um, they don't really have a featured bass player. They have different guys, I guess, come in and play on the records. Um, and I'm not sure what they did, um, you know, when they would play live. But um, I can't really think of another band that really didn't have a featured bass player. Um, was that kind of something you picked up on right away when you um, first became a fan? Uh, no, because, you know, you couldn't really tell when you listened to their music. And yeah. there's a lot of... Uh, the music that they did when they went into the studio, they would have a studio musician yeah. uh, playing the bass parts. And then when they would go on the road, they would either have that person tour with them as the bass player, or they would hire a, uh, you know, a, you know, professional bass player to yeah. play the bass parts with them. Yeah. But early in their career, uh, you know, th that was kind of like later on that they started doing that with bass players. Uh -huh. But pre previous to that, uh, it was uh, the keyboardist, Ray Manzanarek, oh, okay. uh, that would be holding down the bass lines. But, see, you know, when when they talked to him about it, uh, he... he they, I, I, don't, I it was an agreement between him and the producers okay. that the that the bass lines that would be played on the keyboards were too confining oh. and that they if they had a bass player playing the bass lines they could make the bass lines more uh expressive oh wow interesting okay that's interesting and you know um jim morrison like we've been talking about he was like kind of a rebel of the band and um before la woman was released like a few years before 1969 i guess um, and I remember seeing this when I went to see the Oliver Stone um, uh, movie about the Doors and uh, with Val Kilmer, and this was a big part of that movie. Um, seeing uh, when they play this Miami, Florida concert, and Jim Morrison just kind of goes crazy, and he, um, you know, the, the concert shut down. He exposes himself on stage, um, gets arrested for indecent exposure, and um, it was such a big thing um, back in 1969 that. Um, it, they were getting so much um, backlash just from that one concert and this little episode he did on stage that. Um, but those are the things that made him famous. Yeah, that, but the point is, it, it so much, so much that um, the Doors in 1969, many of the radio station would blacklist them. They they weren't playing the um, any of his songs on the radio. A lot of these stations, they were kind of a, uh, you know, uh, a boycott against the Doors. But again, like you said, that's what he was legendary for, and. Um, you know, several years later, I mean, not until, this just happened a couple, you know, a um, number of years ago, 2010, I, um, you know, he, he was eventually uh, convicted of a charge, and, but in 2010, um, the governor in Florida, he, he dropped, um, he did, he did a pardon, and so it's, it's, uh, even though he's been dead for years, you know, it's off his record, it's just kind of an interesting note I, I, I seen there. Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think, it's it, it's kind of you know I, I'm sure when they dropped the charges the uh, you know the authorities felt it was ridiculous yeah. <laughs> for it to even stand yeah yeah know? and it's probably because it was you Jim know? Morrison that hey we're gonna we're gonna you know we're gonna do you know, it to this rocker guy lie. yeah <laughs> but, you know but he yeah. would, I mean you, you go all the way back to uh, light my fire on the Ed Sullivan yeah, show yeah, yeah. that you know that was a very controversial thing and he you know they they got banned from the ed sullivan show but did that hurt their career no hell no 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 no, no. they exploded because he did that yeah if anything if anything it kind of added to the um it added to the the, the, the story and it's interesting because you mentioned in 1971 um well you know after ellie woman was um released he dies three months later and you know after this album is released and um it's like the final album with him and, and talking about the album cover for a minute um we we're talking about how jim jim morrison's become so iconic but he's almost like the um mascot if you will of the band i mean i'm look i'm here's we're talking i got um the doors essential the uh, essential doors hits it's like a greatest hit collection all all the songs we know and love and um it's just morrison on the cover by himself um in, in that probably single shot you've seen a million times before but on la woman um, that's another iconic uh, door shot that um, probably seen for years, but it's um, the four guys like as a band, and it's kind of interesting that we got that cover because I remember seeing like downtown, you know, right above the whiskey, they used to have a sign of that um, down there in Hollywood, and seen it all over the place, and it's in books, and you see it all over the internet. And my point is, just you know, 50 years later, that is such an iconic shot. That's like the shot of the four guys we get on the album cover. That's like. Um, that was the final kind of vision we got of the Doors. 
Well, you know, I I, I think uh, you know he he accomplished so much in a short amount of time, but the reason why he accomplished it is because uh, that that thing that I've mentioned so many times in interviews with you yeah. about the crucial element. Uh, <laughs> for art and the crucial element uh, that will keep music alive for many years to come uh, is that rebellion. Oh, yeah. You know, as long as you're going to have uh, y- uh, younger generations, uh, you know, pushing on th- the older generation, uh, and the older generation is trying to clamp down on them and try to hold mm. them down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to have rebellion, it, it, and yeah. uh, you know that that rebellion can be in many different shapes and forms. That it can be in music, it can be in your your uh, you know your thought process, it can be in your fashion. Uh, it can be, you know, it can be in so many different things. But as long as you have those two elements, you're going to have re- rebellion. And, th- you know, that is the thing that uh, uh, will always be what catapulted um, Jim Morrison, you know, you know, because that is exactly what he was doing on the Ed Sullivan show. That's exactly what he was doing when he was doing concerts and he was having run ins yeah. uh, with the authorities. You know, the authorities uh, doing this, um, trying to keep people down and stuff yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. you know, uh, uh, even goes back to comedians back in the 1950s. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lenny Bruce. Mm-hmm. Lenny Bruce was a very famous comedian, uh, but his his uh, subject matter uh, for his uh, jokes and his whole repertoire uh, was very risque, especially yeah, yeah, yeah. for the time. And so cops would show up at his uh, shows. Uh, just waiting for him to say something uh, that they could arrest him for. Oh yeah, yeah. And and of course, you know, you know, he'd see them lined up at the back, just waiting for him to say, and then he would taunt, you know, through his act. And what do you think that did for his crowds of people coming oh, to yeah. his they, uh, they, they, to see his comedy act? They they hear the story from other people, and they're like, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, we got to go see that it, guy. You know, it's it, the rebellion yeah. thing. It just made his popularity explode. Yeah, and uh, you know, but yeah. but then you know, then of course you know they'd have the grand finale. Lenny Bruce would say something that would get him in trouble, and then the cops would you know march right up to the stage and yeah. you know you know before the show was ended and handcuff him and march him out, and you know while the people in the audience would be yelling at the cops, and uh, you know you know. You know, but that's see what I'm saying about the element. Oh yeah, and you know um, of rebellion. Oh yeah, and, and even even to further that point, I mean, um, another thing that Jim uh, Morrison is known for is um, um, he he was dubbed the Lizard King. I mean, um, let's just say for his his manhood, if you will. I mean, it became stuff of legendary status. I mean that that's how you know that's how crazy it got, so to speak. Um, I mean, all these years later, when you hear the Lizard King, we, we associate with Jim Morrison. A lot of people know what know what it's in reference to. And um, but again, Jim Morrison went from being this rebellious kind of um, crazy rocker dude to, to all these years, you know, fifty years after his death, he's now he's no more and more viewed as a um, you know an iconic genius, a great uh, a great writer, uh, an artist. Uh, I mean, like you said, I mean. It, it, you know his kind of legendary status goes up more and more each each year since since he's kind of um, passed on. It, it just like you said, it, it's amazing how things evolve. Even the people that were trying to shut him down back in the day, some of those people that are still around. I mean, um, a lot of them have a um, you know they're not so critical of him, obviously, you know, because he's he's no longer with us. 
Well, but there there was also a rumor back in the day that Mojo Ryzen was a sexual innuendo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, when you listen to that part, it starts out slow. Yeah. And then it keeps you, and then all of a sudden, by yeah. the time it gets to the uh, end, it's built up to a literal frenzy. And basically, how does sex go? It starts out slow, yeah, yeah, yeah. and by the time yeah, yeah. you're about ready to the end, you're going... At a fast pace, and you're going into a frenzy. Yeah, yeah. So that was, you know, that was the rumor about uh, Mojo a, Rising. And Mojo, um, Mojo is interesting because um, that that's also a reference to the blues. And it, it's um, as we see here talking about the Doors and kind of pop culture and and, and their relevance in pop culture. Um, I don't know if you're even aware of this, but like. Um, one of my favorite places to go is like Barnes and Noble bookstore. I mean, they got a lot of great, you know, if you're into music and they got a lot of um, great uh, magazines and books on like um, movies and entertainment. And I seen um, in the magazine rack they have a magazine uh, called Mojo, and um, I think it's named after the um, Doors song. So I mean, even even books and magazines are being published, you know, in reference to the Doors. Well, mochos, uh, it's become a slang term now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you know, you got some spunk to you. That's, it's your mojo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's, it's thing, you know, something, it just plays on words can take lives of their own, yeah. you know, but, uh, you know, it's, it's so trippy to, uh, you know, think about, um, you know, think about him and how he combined all these things that were a, a huge uh, influence on him, uh, you know, going all the way back to his time at, at UCLA, yeah. uh, where uh, by the time he uh, had graduated, he actually graduated uh, from UCLA, which I kind of, you know, you look at it, Jim Morrison graduated, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, but uh, he graduated, but uh, he, you know, as soon as he graduated, he just went completely bohemian. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you know, um, just kind of yeah. living, uh, you know, yeah, I was basically reading, yeah. getting high and taking LSD and, you know, living on, you know, living on a rooftop with his friends and, you know, he he didn't go the same way that mo everybody else went, uh, as far as um, you know when they graduated from UCLA, especially at that time. You know, everybody else was graduating and going into the workforce. Yeah, he was going in the opposite direction. Yeah, and you know, and, yeah. and that was during a time that you know was uh, was uh, a very naive time. Yeah. When it came to drug use, because uh, there was just a lot of people that were experimenting. And, you know, of course, you know, weed was very prevalent at that time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there was, you know, that was also during, a, you know, the hippie area, era where there was a lot of people that were experimenting with LSD. And, and that was, uh, you know... Um, you know, yeah, even, crazy drug. Yeah, and, and it was. You know? I mean, even I, I think in a past interview um, when you and I were talking about the Beatles, I mean, there, there's a reference to Lucy um, in the Sky with Diamonds. I mean, uh, a lot of people. I remember hearing the story for years when I was a kid, and people saying, "Oh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds." Well, if you abbreviate that, it spells out LSD. And and I'm like, you know, who stops and kind of thinks about this stuff? But um, somebody obviously was, because uh, I mean, even even that um, reference to the Beatles and. And that song, Loosing the Sky with Diamonds, I mean, people um, even reading LSD into that, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, there's, you know, I, I can see where it would probably uh, be an, an element yeah, to yeah. the song, you know, because, you know, but I wouldn't say that LSD is the single most element of yeah. that song. Because, yeah, yeah. Uh, by the time the Beatles reached that point, uh, they were really, uh, ex you know, reaching outside of the box uh, with uh, po poet poetic uh, lyrics. Yeah, and, and you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah. You know, it's just you know when when you become a great artist. Yeah, and and becoming a great artist is in many many different ways. John Lennon 
part of John Lennon's greatness as an artist was his ability uh, to expand the boundaries with lyric writing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, and I think yeah. I think that song has has every bit as much to do uh, with expanding the boundaries of lyric writing, not just having solely only to do with LSD. Yeah, but yeah. make no mistake about it, uh, there was a LSD influence in there. Okay, and you know, um, but it's just yeah. a partial influence. Yeah, and as you and I have talked. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, I mean, that's one of the things that um, I think really makes a lot of these um, great bands stand out. Is I mean, um, the songwriting—you got to, you got to have great, um, great songs, or you're not going to go far. And, and that's the thing is, Jim Morrison was um, a casualty, like a lot of people, of his addiction, and and that's part of the reason he died so tragically young. But again, look at what he accomplished. Um, at, you know, dying at 27 years of a um, age. You know. 20, 27 years old, I mean, just, and we look at all these great songs he left us. We're talking about him and all his music and his songs and, and all this great stuff he left us 50 years after he's, he's died. He's still relevant. And, and, and that says, I think, something about not just his overall talent, but, but I mean, the songwriting. I mean, it, 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 I mean, we're talking about, so, I mean, it, it, it's left an impression on us, you know? Yes, yes. My favorite song by The Doors, uh, my personal favorite, Yeah. The End. Interesting. And yeah, that, that's a lot of people um, lo lo love that song. And um, I remember hearing that when I went to see The Doors movie by Oliver Stone we mentioned earlier. Um, another one I love, it very much like um, Light My Fire. Um, a lot of the best songs by The Doors... Um, or some of the most simple, simple songs. For example, one of my all-time favorites also is um, very much like "Light My Fire," "Touch Me." I mean, in just a few words, it says it all, and you, you kind of get the innuendo. But I mean, when he sings that, he's singing it from way down there, you know. <laughs> well, there's so many elements to the end. Yeah. That that I I just you know just really you know made me appreciate that song. Uh, was number one uh, it was the whole band that was really pushing the boundaries because you have to think about it mm -hmm. that the, the time period as far as like music and instruments and technology was very very limiting yeah I mean really really limiting compared to what's of you know I mean you can do anything you want nowadays and, and yet, uh, yet knowing that the, the band yeah. itself musically was really pushing the boundaries, uh, being very artistic with the music end of it. Yeah. Uh, because it was, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of music during that, you know, the, you know, the late sixties when that, when that music came out, yeah. there wasn't a whole lot th that was going on that was that experimentive. Yeah. Musically. And, yeah. And, and, but then yeah. you take, and you put it together with the element of, um, you know, the the poetic lyrical content yeah. that uh, Morrison was putting to that music. It was really very artistic, very very artistic uh, with the lyrics, and and then of course, you know, I like the dark side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like horror movies, yeah, yeah. and I like it, you know what I mean. And that those you know that the lyrics and everything are very very dark. Yeah, and when you consider, like you say, the technology of making records was not what it is today. Even knowing that, and you listen to you listen to these songs, um, you know, you, you get out your favorite door CD and you put it on, and um, fifty years later. Um, it doesn't matter what the technology was back then. It, the music just rocks. It still, it really stands out. And um, you kind of hear, I guess you could say flaws and all, which there really aren't that many. But like you said, this came out like the doors, uh, you know, they were out like in the, the 60s. And that's right around that peace, love, flower power generation, you know, of Woodstock. And if you think, you know, if your first impression was doors is, okay, they come out in the 60s, so they must have been one of those bands they, they definitely aren't they were one of the more rebellious bands as you say and i think the other guys in the band as talented as they were they, they were very smart also because to let allow morrison to do his thing i mean 
as they as they show, would eventually see once he you know died um, in 1971, I think they made the right decision not to try to carry on without him. Because could you imagine being the guy that's going to replace Jim Morrison? I mean, could yeah, could, could yeah, you imagine the backlash? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I I did like when they uh, you know put put a, a a thing together with Ian Asbury. Yes, yes. Uh, because yes. I I really felt that Ian Asbury Asbury's voice uh, was, uh, in its own way, you know, really a, a good combination of re-representing uh, Jim Morrison's yeah. work and stuff. I, I just, I just liked uh, the combination of having him, uh, you know, do the singing for uh, for that that thing when they put that together and I guess there's a lot of people because they they successfully toured uh, for quite a while yeah uh, with you know with Ian uh, as the lead singer so it must have been successful yeah I kind of wish they would have done a CD of that but um I, I guess the, the one thing that kind of got in their way is I, I guess the drummer John Dinsmore he he wasn't in favor, yeah. and he, he yeah. He, well, he, yeah. he he wasn't making any money off of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah can I, hey, can I make a comparison? Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, I would say that Axl Rose, the person that I portray uh, in Appetite you know, for Destruction, yeah, portray. You know, the person I portray is a combination. Of Jim Morrison and Janis Joplin. Funny you say that. Um, I, um, I kind of see the Janis comparison now, but um, I, I was gonna. I was thinking that earlier when we were talking about um, a lot, of, a lot of, about Jim Morrison and his rebellious attitude. I was thinking, you know, Axl Rose kind of has that same, you know, fu attitude. I mean, probably the best example of that is um, the Guns N' Roses song "Get in the Ring." I mean. That was kind of an F you to the establishment, that song, if anybody knows what I'm talking about. It's yeah, kind of, you want me to tell you what Get In The Ring was about? Uh, yeah, 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 go ahead. I saw them in concert when uh, he was reading uh, about uh, some, I don't know. It, it was a rift between Axl Rose and Vince Neil. Well, okay, but if you if you dig and into he was saying, you know, yeah. they were they were going back and forth against each other yeah. in the media and the you know through the press. I do remember saying that yeah. disparaging things about each other, and Axel was saying, "Okay, M. Effer, get in the ring. Let's settle this." That's what because I you know he was talking about it when I saw them in concert, and it was everything to do about that rift. Between, between Axl Rose and Vince Neil. Now it was also it was also if you, if you get a little deep into the lyrics, there's a section where he's naming off people that kind of um, criticize him in the press. Like there's one point where he says Bob Guccione, um, Andy Searcher from Hip Raider, and he's naming off these guys that kind of uh, trashed him in the press, and he's kind of like calling them out. And and after that song um, was released, I remember all those like all those rock mags magazines that. Um, like Andy Searcher, Hip Raider, um, you know, um, a lot of people start trash on that guy. You're like, oh, how dare you, you know, trash Axl Rose and this and that. So, again, just um, Axl Rose, I agree with you. I'm very much Jim Morrison like. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. When when you think about it, you know, Axl Rose was famous for a lot of the same type of things because of his erratic behavior yeah, yeah. uh throwing down mics ha walking off the stage in the middle of shows yeah. uh showing up to the concert hours late and everybody would have to wait in the building like an hour or two hours oh, yeah. for them to finally hit the stage uh, these are all things that Jim Morrison used to do back in his day yeah and and for the same reason uh, that it made Jim Morrison famous because he was so rebellious and he was so f you about yeah, everything. Yeah. You know, you know, I'll show up whenever I feel like it. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So and, Axel and, had that same thing going on, and and it was basically kind of creating that same uh, uh, artist audience 
persona relationship. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But then you take that and you put, you know, listen to his voice and look who his predecessor was vocally. Oh, yeah. Janice. Because she was doing that same wheezy, raspy, you know, kind of laying out the groundwork. And, and then Axel just took it to a whole nother level. Yeah. But but that, that same type of approach to vocals, uh, Janice was doing uh, many, many years before, before Axel. And I, I just find it very hard to believe that that was not an influence on Axel. I, yeah. It has to be, it has to have been. And you know, it, it's interesting um, because I, I do this other, um, this other show called Remembering um, Woodstock where I look back with, um, Vince Lupo, he's a drummer from um, the original drummer from Mick Adams and the Stones, and and what we do is we look back on the, the Woodstock era of music because um, he was sharing with me that he actually um, attended one of the um, three days of Woodstock, and we talk about all these acts that played Woodstock. But um, you know, I, I bring this up because in doing that with him, I learned that um, Janis Joplin, of course, also died the same year as Jim Morrison. Also at age of twenty seven, nineteen seventy one. Part of the twenty seven club, yeah. yeah. And and it's kind of interesting because um, both Jim Morrison and Janis Joplin released like one final album, like just I think in Janis's case too it was like two or three months. Um, you know, um, well, I think her album, which was Pearl, is also celebrating fiftieth anniversary of this year. That was released after she died. And um, Jim Morrison released, uh, and The Doors released, uh, L.A. Woman, I think, like three months before he died. So they didn't even, that, that album's kind of gone on to become what it has without even much touring behind it. Well, you know, she's one of my favorite singers. You know, there's a lot of people that, you know, I mean, because, uh, you know, people, people nowadays look at things out of mm -hmm. perspective. Oh, yeah. Uh, technology was in its infancy, then, uh, yeah. and uh, what what Janice was doing during that time really had never been done. You know that that type of singing with with you know coming from your soul emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, you know, she bled the blues. Oh you yeah, know, you can't think of a more emotional. Uh, you know way of uh you know just pouring your heart out yeah. uh you know in those lyrics and and just putting emotion into it but there's no technology it's just her and that raw voice that you know basically nobody was singing wheezing and rasping like that before oh, yeah and it really uh you know I, my parents you know were into perry como wow wow and, you know, <laughs> yeah dean martin and all that kind of stuff and and um, you know my dad even like oh wow listen to that chick sing man yeah he didn't he, say it in those words he could but he was basically saying he liked that yeah but you know but but now because everything has so much more technology and so much slick producing and and people have uh been able to take what people used to do in the past and take it to higher levels and and you know generation out does the previous generation out doing yeah, that yeah, generation yeah. and out doing the next generation and, and then you look back and it's so raw you go oh i don't like that yeah, and you. But, know, yeah. but at that time, back yeah. in the late '60s, when Janice was doing that, uh, it was brand new, and it was really turning everybody on their on the on, you know go, what the hell is this? Where did that shit come from? And, oh, and you man. know, you know what's interesting Nobody about sings yeah. like that. You know what's interesting about Janice Joplin? I mean, she was not like a lot of these female artists. We have. She was not like drop dead gorgeous, but, but in spite of that. She became such a huge star, and and what I'm what I'm saying is, I mean, um, you know, she's not one of these artists that made it on her looks. I mean, she really she oozed no, talent. No, no, I mean, she, in fact, she you, lived a very rough life. Yeah, uh, because you know, uh, you know, because she wasn't that good looking. She uh, goes all the way, you know, all the way back to her high school days. She was uh, picked on and you know, bullied big time. Yeah. You know, uh, what, what you know. 
what we call cyberbullying yeah, now yeah. Uh, was going on in her uh, societal sur- surroundings in high school. Yeah. Uh, she was treated extremely, extremely bad uh, by the people that she went to high school with. Yeah, I heard a lot uh, of. But us then again, Sandra, the reason yeah. why she was treated is because she didn't fit in. She was not meant to be uh, with that group of people. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. She was meant to be with artistic people. She was an artist. And artists are different from mainstream society. Yeah. It, you know what I mean? And, and there's a lot of artists that are tortured souls just like she was. And, and, she, and I yeah. guarantee you, just like Jim Morrison, you know, has his tortured soul too. There, There's the element of being a tortured soul uh, for some artists, oh, yeah. that they they're able to manifest it into uh, beautiful, beautiful art. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even so much to the point that I mean, Janice, I dare say, was uh, you know female Jim Morrison, so to speak. I mean, um, she could sing every front thing from you know just full blown out rock to um, almost sound like a angel singing like a gospel song. Um, and you know, I, I she she yeah. actually had a fling with uh, a, an affair type thing with uh, Jim Morrison. Ooh, interesting. Um, I, I didn't know that about her, but but yeah, um, didn't end well. You know, and actually, um, it was picking up um, one of Gilby Clark. He's a former guitar player from Guns N' Roses. One of his solo albums that he did a great cover of her song Mercedes Benz. So now um, that's one of my favorite songs. Yeah, and I it's just, just and, a sure ditty. Now, now, if you listen to Gilby's version, it, it's a, you know, when I, because his is the version I heard of that song first. Um, the version he does is a great, like, rockin' guitar kind of um, tune, which you'd expect from Gilby Clark. And it was interesting, because when I heard the original Janice version of that song, it's almost like just a stripped-down vocal tune. I mean, doesn't have much music back in it. It's, and, yeah, and, yeah, and, it's basically yeah. just her. And I was like, that's wow. That's her greatness. Yeah, I was like, wow, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I love that song. Yeah, and, and so that, that again, that's 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 a that's a true test of a of a great song that um, a song like that could you know inspire somebody like Gilby Clark to kind of um do to do his own guitar version and kind of turn people on to it. And then when you hear the when you hear um, her version, which is drastically different, it's it's still kind of a cool tune, and you're like, wow, how did she ever come up with that? Well, I love her. You know, her version will always be my absolutely Ooh. positively favorite. Yeah, yeah. You know, the you know she did that on Pearl. That was her last uh, release that she did before she died. You know, but you know, you don't die that way. You don't die like Jim Morrison. You don't die like uh, you know Janis uh, Joplin. Yeah. Uh, Janis Joplin, and you and you don't you know what I mean you, you don't die like like that. Uh, at at a young age, without being a tortured soul. Yeah, and you know, even, you know, you yeah. look at it. Kurt Cobain's part of that. I was just going to uh, say that. I mean, when, another when we, yeah. tortured soul. You yeah. know, I'm sure Jimi Hendrix had his, you know, uh, tortured soul part of it because, you know, I mean, when you die that young. Yeah. You know, Amy Winehouse oh, is yeah. part of the Twenty Seven Club, and it's well known that she was a tortured soul. But that's part of because you know, uh, it's 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 part of their DNA that that fueled their art. Yeah, yeah, and you know, you know, another classic rock band that I really love is um, Creedence Clearwater Revival. If you know who John Fogerty is, I mean, he was. Oh. <laughs> How he was could a, I not? He was a main guy in that band, and, and it's kind of interesting. Is you had the four guys. I mean, I mean John Fogerty and Stu Cook, the bass player and the drummer, Doug Clifford. They all they were all much younger, and they they went to school together. And then they had John Fogerty's older brother, and apparently him and his brother just could not stand one. They hated each other's guts so much that um, even you'd hear um, John Fogerty badmouth his brother even years after he's like been dead and you're like okay you 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 won you know what i mean but apparently that these guys had so much friction in that band and they all um hated each other that that it made for beautiful music <laughs> well you know but there's no mistaking about it the yeah. star of the show was john Ford. oh yeah yeah no doubt because they you know they were never able to uh, achieve anything 
uh, close to what they were able to do when they were working with uh, oh, John yeah, Fogarty. Yeah, when and, he and, left, that they basically collapsed. And he's still... He's and still, it's kind of yeah, like, you yeah. know, the doors without Jim Morrison. Yeah, yeah. You know, without Jim Morrison... It collapses, you know. You know, the, it was a great band and everything like that. But the, you know, the star of the show, the the main, you know, the magnetic yeah. personality of Jim Morrison had uh, just just so much to do with what made that band so popular. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because even um, as talented as other guys were, like you said, Jim Morrison, he was. He was a he was a voice. He was the face of that band. I mean, it, it kind of surprised me that um, Robbie Krager didn't even get much of a guitar hero status in the Doors. I mean, he he has since put out like several solo albums. He's they're um, like a lot obviously guitar oriented more and doesn't sound too much like the the Doors. But um, you know, he's still doing his thing. So so you gotta you gotta love and respect that. I know a John Densmore. He's not out there as much because from what I've heard is um, from all those years of playing um, playing that music. Um, he, he, like a lot of people, it, it affected him, his hearing, so he's not able, I don't think, to get out there as much and play. Well, they were playing loud music without yeah. earplugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody, nobody knew what kind of damage, you know, it did you're then. doing to yourself. You know, and, and, and I, I have to say, I'm, I'm blown away that I can still hear yeah. myself. I, I have lost some hearing. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I went many years in the 80s, uh, playing, you know, extremely loud yeah. decibels, uh, you know, you know, during that time period, and and then you know, m- even many years afterwards, uh, without using any kind of ear protection. R- honestly, it's it's a miracle that I can still hear. And, and um, final question for the day, uh, Gar. I really enjoyed talking about all this with you um, once again. But um, final question for the day is: Do you have an update for any of your? Um fans out there waiting to see appetite for destruction i know we're going through this COVID 19 but have you heard any um anything about when some of the places might start to open up again well you know uh, as far as i know uh, you know I, it, it, most of the places that we play are really large venues uh-huh. you know places like the house of blues you know and you know places that hold a thousand people or more and uh you know i i haven't really heard anything from uh yeah. these type of venues uh, that are that kind of size uh that have any kind of a green light yeah. as far as to when they're going to be able to because uh, basically, it's just going to, you know, have to reach a point yeah, eventually. Uh, yeah. to to where people can gather together uh, in in uh, l- large numbers in close proximity to each other. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. and be able to do that and, and ha- not have your, uh, you know, life in danger. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so... Um, I don't know when places like that are going to be able to, Open. Uh, you know, get back to doing what they do. Uh, but it's it's really it's really hard to be that kind of a band that plays those type of yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, places and and things like that, and um, you know and you know do that and and you know when when you know you basically you have you know well okay we can play to like 40 or 50 yeah, people is it worth it know? though yeah yeah is it worth your while you, you know what i mean yeah yeah it, it, it's not what you do yeah yeah um so i'm i'm you know we're still on hiatus right now you know the the band's still together yeah you're not the only uh, one you know <laughs> yeah. we, we stay in touch and, yeah, yeah and uh we're all you know very good friends so, you know it, our our band has become uh, very family. Oh, good. You know, good. it's yeah. it's it. You know, it's it. it it's so uh, you you hear the stories about you know people playing in bands. And, yeah, yeah. And and it's so hard to keep a band together uh, because you have you know four or five or six people, yeah, yeah. different personalities uh, bouncing off each other and. And you know the, the odds 
are that people are going to bounce off of e- you know off, off of each other in a bad way. Yeah. Uh, the odds of that is very, very high. Yeah. And so it's really, really hard to keep bands together. And, and that's, you know, it's it's just because it, I remember it was really popular on MTV when it used yeah, yeah, <laughs> when, yeah. when they when they first you kind of switched over from music to TV shows and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and yeah, they, yeah. They had this show called Real World. Yeah, that's what did it. That's what kind of did a, it, yeah. A bunch of different strangers and put them in a house just oh, yeah. to see what happens when they bounce off each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, being in a band is like that. Wow, wow. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because yeah. when you put together a band together and, and it's a, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of new within that first year. Uh, that's usually, you know, when thing people bounce off each other, and 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 if it's going to go in a bad way, it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. And, yeah, and I hear that's you. the number one reason why bands wind up breaking off is because they don't bounce off of each other well, which is the same formula to real world. Yeah, I, so I love that, hearing it's that. It's yeah. so hard to keep a band together to get, yeah. because of that. Uh, but, you know, this band with this lineup has been together for such a long time now. We've, uh, our, our newest, uh, member, uh, is PJ, the guitarist. And, okay. Uh, he's been with the band now for, uh, like, uh, a year and a half. Is he the, uh, is he play the Izzy or the Slash? Uh, Slash. Oh, okay. Interesting. interesting. And, yeah. and, um. You know, I just I just talked to him uh, recently, and you know because uh, he he mo- him and his wife moved uh, to Las Vegas, and he was afraid that oh we're gonna have to look for a new slash and all that stuff. Yeah. And you know, we decided that you know you know we love him so much. We'll work it out. You know, yeah. he can move to Las Vegas, and we'll still you know find a way to make it happen. That's you know, great. He's, I, he's love that. I love hearing family. I love hearing that. Uh, they didn't like living in Vegas yeah. and all that, but wow. they, they, what, what he said is they, they felt that they, they all of a sudden they, you know, they, they were, uh, you know, they weren't able to, you know, stay in touch with their really good friends. Yeah. And everything, and so they're, they they just yeah. moved back to yeah. Los Angeles from Las Vegas. Even Vegas you know, isn't what it used to be, you so, know. But yeah. you know, but that's that's how tight knit we are. Is, I love that. Even him moving to Las Vegas, you know, we love him so much. It, it didn't matter to any of the rest of wow, us. Wow, wow. Nobody had a problem with that's it. That's great. I love hearing that, Gar. Well, I think t- uh, we've come to that time again to wrap it up, Gar. But if you could hold on just for a minute, or something, I want to run by you real quick, okay?